Welcome to HSC Economics Made Easy. This video is part of a series on economic growth. Today's topic is one of my personal favorites in the whole course. I believe in this topic lies the answer to how to have sustained improvements in human well-being, and that's super exciting for me. In previous videos, we've established that changes in economic activity in the short term can be explained by movements in aggregate demand. Today, we're going to be looking at aggregate supply, which plays an important role in long-term economic growth. So why am I so enthusiastic about this topic? When aggregate supply is increased, it's great news because it means that we can produce a greater output at a lower price. In other words, we're satisfying more wants and needs while using less resources, approaching the economic problem more effectively and improving human well-being. That's why on one hand, you have Keynesian economists and policymakers who focus on influencing aggregate demand. And on the other hand, you have classical economists who focus on increasing aggregate supply. So how do we increase aggregate supply? The broader answer would be to increase the resources available to the economy, as well as increasing efficiency to reduce costs. Let's break this down. How can we increase resources available? Well, let's go through the resources. Land resources refer to natural resources. More advanced extraction methods and technologies could increase the availability of these resources. Furthermore, a shift from non-renewable to renewable energy could mean that we are shifting from finite land resources to something more available. Second is labor resources. We could increase the quantity of labor by increasing the population. It's no coincidence that the three largest countries by population, US, China, and India, are also three of the largest or fastest growing economies in the world. Labor resources can also be increased by maximizing the participation rate. The third resource is capital. The amount of capital goods such as efficient machinery or AI can be increased with technological advancements or funds for investment. Last resource is enterprise. The amount of entrepreneurs in an economy can increase in similar ways to labor. Obviously, a larger population would include a larger amount of innovators and business owners. Entrepreneurship can also be encouraged with financial incentives and deregulation with the removal of government rules and restrictions. Next, let's talk about increasing efficiency in order to increase aggregate supply. An economy can have three types of efficiency, technical, allocative, and dynamic efficiency. Technical efficiency is the ability of an economy to maximize output while minimizing input costs. It's productivity, but at a whole economy level. That's why many microeconomic policies are aimed at increasing competition and market forces. They're based on the assumption that when there's competition and a profit motive, firms and workers have an incentive to work harder, hence maximizing their output at the given cost. Technical efficiency can be measured using productivity indexes, so you can incorporate these stats in your extended responses to support this. Next, allocative efficiency is achieved when resources are allocated to where they are most valued, reflecting consumer demand. This concept is often used to criticize government subsidies and protection for certain industries. For example, up until the 2010s, car manufacturing was receiving subsidies for decades so that it could survive. In effect, resources were being taken from taxpayers to produce cars in Australia. The argument against this was that if the market wanted Australian cars, consumers would purchase cars by their own accord. Furthermore, taxing consumers to subsidize cars is not only forceful, but it was an inefficient allocation of resource. By getting rid of subsidies, consumers could theoretically get a reduction in taxes and choose for themselves how to allocate resources. Of course, the car manufacturing industry declined and saw job losses, but in the long term, they were allocated to growing industries where there was consumer demand, such as construction and services. This shift in resources from inefficient industry to efficient is called allocative efficiency. Related to this is dynamic efficiency. What does the word dynamic mean? It's the opposite of static. When something is dynamic, it's quick to change. Dynamic efficiency refers to how quickly an economy can shift resources between industries in response to changing patterns of consumer demand. Some students find it helpful to think of this as allocative efficiency over time. One of my favorite case studies for this is Uber. The ride-sharing app was launched in 2012, but was banned until late 2015 with the ACT being the first to do so. Since becoming legalized, they've become the market leader in ride-sharing and taxi services, showing how much consumers favored them. But for the three years that it was banned, consumers had no choice but to put their resources in the taxi industry. 
This is a resistance to structural change in the economy and contributed to a lack of dynamic efficiency. This is again why microeconomic policies are used. Deregulation can be used to encourage competition, putting pressure on firms and industries to be responsive to consumer demand and technological advancements, leading to dynamic efficiency. To wrap up this video, I want to suggest that education and training is one of the best ways to increase aggregate supply. Not only does it increase technical efficiency, as labor becomes more skillful and therefore more productive. Skilled workers are also more occupationally mobile. This means that their skill sets can be more easily transferred, making them more responsible to structural change, which is dynamic efficiency. I hope my explanations and examples have made it easy for you to understand aggregate supply and efficiency. And on a personal note, I hope my enthusiasm for supply side economics has rubbed off on you. Truth is, many HSC students and teachers like to focus on demand side because you can use that to explain all the fluctuations and that's pretty exciting. Changes in aggregate supply are a lot more gradual, but you can see the impacts on human well-being over time. In fact, you can definitely see it when you compare economic well-being between different countries. How did economies such as Japan, Taiwan, Hong Kong see such improved standards of living over recent decades compared to their Asian neighbors? I believe the answer is in the concepts highlighted in this video. Hey, if this video has helped you, please leave a like, comment, as well as share the video. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel as well as follow us on Facebook so you don't miss out on future videos. I look forward to continuing to make HSC economics easy for you. See you next time.